Hello and welcome to a special webinar presented by the Winter Park Chamber of Commerce in Winter Park, Florida. Welcome, whether you're watching us on Zoom, on Facebook Live, or after the fact on YouTube or at our website at winterpark.org. We know that we have a full house today and I'll share with you that we are at capacity on our Zoom audience, but I encourage you to watch this on Facebook Live and also to take a moment to share it on your page so that we can spread the word about the incredible vision for this new addition to Winter Park. I would like to get us started by introducing the President and CEO of the Winter Park Chamber of Commerce, Betsy gardner Eckbert. Good morning, Amy, and thank you. I want to thank our team for getting all of this organized today. And just to frame why we're here, the Chamber of Commerce exists to convene people and ideas for the benefit of our businesses and our community. And when we think about the intersection of community and business and opportunity today, I can't think of a better person to speak to this than Sir David Age. It is my absolute privilege to introduce him. Sir David Age is a Ghanaian British architect who's received international acclaim for his impact on the field. He was born in Tanzania to Ghanaian parents and his influences range from, range from contemporary art, music and science to African art forms and the civic life of cities. In 2000, he founded Age Associates which today operates globally with studios in Accra, London, and New York, with projects spanning across the globe. Known for his ingenious use of materials and his sculptural ability, David Ajay has established himself as an architect with an artist's sensibility and vision. His projects range from private houses, bespoke furniture collections, product design, exhibitions, and temporary pavilions to major art centers, civic buildings, and master plans. Ajay's largest project to date, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., opened on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. in 2016, and it was named the Cultural Event of the Year by the New York Times. In 2017, Ajay was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II and was recognized as one of the 100 most influential people of the year by Time Magazine. In addition to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, selected works include the Webster in Los Angeles, a new flagship retail space for the luxury multi-brand retailer, Ruby City, a new art center in San Antonio, Texas, the Sugar Hill mixed use development in Harlem, New York, two neighborhood libraries in Washington, DC, the Alara Concept Store in Lagos, Nigeria, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, Colorado, the Ethelbert Cooper Gallery of African and American Art in the Hutchins Center at Harvard University, the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, and the Ideas Stores, two community libraries in London. It is a rare and singular privilege to have David Ajay with us this morning. David, welcome. So much, Betsy. Thank you for spending time with us. You are in Ghana now. I am, yes. I'm yes, and you have three offices across the world. You have an office in Ghana, in Accra, and then also New York and London. Is that correct? That's correct. And you really bring this kind of global literacy to everything that you do. So I think it's relevant that you all are operating with a global footprint. That's one of the exciting things about being able to connect to this project in Winter Park, the hyper locality and the global piece of it coming together as Orlando becomes a more and more global destination, this is an exciting time. So we wanna kind of frame the type of work that you do, and, and I've studied a little bit about you in preparation for this, and one of the things that really strikes me about the way you approach this work is the role of narrative, and that you approach work with this sort of ambition to build transformational narratives. Can you talk a little bit about your process and about this intersection of civic and cultural work um, being at the core of your practice? Um, thank you so much, Betsy. Um, architecture for me, um, I was inspired to do architecture because of this potential that I discovered as a young man that architecture had the power to frame the social context and to edify and empower communities in profound ways than um, I had previously thought. 
And in realizing that and in studying architecture, I realized that I wanted to practice as much as possible in the public realm and to be in the most democratic arena to inspire and influence the greatest amount of people. Um, for me, architecture is one of those beautiful art forms that continually has to be remade, continually has to be refined for every generation. It's not as though we just make one architecture and then that's it. It has to be recalibrated. And so this really is at the heart of why we work. And the idea um, of sort of really making sure that we are bringing as much knowledge into the experience of architecture is central to how my, me and myself and my studio work. We work, we use, you know, the knowledge that we know from working in the US, the knowledge that we know from working in Europe, the knowledge that we know and use from working in Europe to try and create a diversity in our knowledge base that really gives the most exceptional, we believe, uh, product to our uh, clients and to our communities. Well, and, and reflecting on some of the work you're doing now, kind of indexing that against the work of like a Frederick Law Olmsted, who used design to create these democratic opportunities for socialization. It seems to me like you're using design to kind of reactivate public life and create these public realm opportunities. We've got a lot of discussion obviously going on in a painful time in America right now about democratizing and making equality of opportunity. Can you talk a little bit about that part of your work and how that sort of activates a lot of your thinking and your process? A lot of, a lot of the initial work and still at the base of the, the foundation of the practice is to make visible um, those forces, communities, institutions that are invisible in our world. Um, and it's not the formal structures, but it's the idea of understanding that as citizens in any community, you sort of enter a contract to be good to each other, to be supportive of each other. And that means that there is your private role in your house, which is your private realm, but you, there is your public role. And that's your, you know, the things you do, you vote, you act, act on things to kind of create edification opportunities for yourself and for the generations that are to come after you. So we are sort of custodians, not just of the world that we live in, the way we want to see it for ourselves, but also custodians of making a future for generations who haven't even been born yet. So this, this is a critical crux, crux of this thinking. Sorry, Betsy, you're, I can see you want to say something. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, I don't want to, I want to hear from you, but I think you know, this is very inspiring. This is sort of an academic way to begin talking, I and mean, we're going to get to the process with specific uh, focus on the Winter Park Library. But I, I want to take everybody on this journey of how you how you approach the work, how you think about the work, and what makes you interested in tackling civic buildings, which are themselves thorny beings. This is a difficult thing. You're managing by committee. You're, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders. We've got public bonds that are funding these things. These are difficult processes. And these are, this is really the path of most resistance, it would seem to me in architecture, is to engage in these public spaces. What is it that makes you excited about doing this work? Because we know you do quite a lot of it when you've got a huge list of celebrities who want you to build homes for them. You're, you know, working on these types of projects instead. And I'm really curious about what drives some of that passion for you. So what drives that passion really is this idea of a civic duty. Um, yes, I can work more, you know, I could choose to work much more in the commercial sector, which is, you know, very very clear sort of parameters. But I am, as I said in the beginning, I hope you sort of start to see that I'm interested in architecture as a story of our time. And I think that you can't, you know, underestimate how much the public institutions and the public structures that we make in our cities, some of which is being contested and discussed in America, not just America, but around the world right now, are the things that actually represent the world that we live in. And so this idea of, even though they are the hardest contested areas and, and we know that they are, you know, we don't do it for the money. We do it because we love it um, and we're, we're, we believe absolutely in, in the ability to tr transform those institutions to then make a better world that we all want to be in. Um, so, you know, it, it's, 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 it's taken very, very seriously. You know, I always say in my studio, yes, we're, you know, I'm an employee, but you're sort of 
entering a sort of vocation. <laughs> You're kind of entering a, a group of people who are passionate about ideas in the world, about our public life, and want a certain uh, equality that actually brings benefit to everyone. And, and, and passionately believe that in that equality and in that bringing um, that to everyone, we actually make a much, much better world than we can if we don't do that. And it's, it's not a statement, it's a belief. So, so this, this way of working and trying to kind of navigate how to create spaces that are democratic across all members of society, all genders, disenfranchised as well as you know those that are very uh, fortunate is really a critical thing that we're always shifting and and what's really amazing is that in the history of architecture this idea of democratizing shifts and change changes you know in the 18th century it was about making palaces for everyone it was about introducing greek temples as symbols of knowledge you know that was the 18th century because we were moving from a kind of medieval uh, period, a, a renaissance that happened in Europe, and a certain sense that that was an enlightenment that needed to happen around the world to kind of quote history. But those, those symbols are very important historical models, but mean different things now. They start to kind of form different messages. So we need as architects, just as we transformed the world in the 1800s, in the 1900s, in the 20th century, at the beginning of the 21st century, here we go again. The world has shifted. We have new technologies. We have new ways of making visible our publics and our relationships to each other. We actually have now global connections where we can do a talk across Accra, London, the world. I mean, we are in a new space and that requires that our environments also have to, I think, remake themselves to make sense. Those that are precious to us that really have made sense can be kept, but those that don't make sense have to be remade because we continually have to perfect this idea that we've all chosen to be part of, which is this civilization called human beings, right? <laughs> David, I've heard you speak about, with specifics on the library piece, that we yeah. want to move past this stack of shelves kind of ethos, this knowledge box ethos, where we think about a library as a repository of knowledge. And, yes. and fueled by technology and that intersection of architecture and technology, you know, we're a chamber of commerce. So we drive people to the library so they can learn new skills virtually. They can go in and use free Wi-Fi and upskill on proprietary databases that our library has. Our people that we're driving over there, we're trying to help them be entrepreneurs through their use of the library. And that's our focus as a pro-business organization. So we'll be aligning with that part of the library's programs very heavily. And so I love as we're having this national conversation about the equality of opportunity, the role that a library can play in allowing someone to copy a business plan, learn some Excel skills, all the kinds of things that can help you move up the sort of social mobility ladder. And how does that create uh, an activation point for an entrepreneur, et cetera? So we're really interested in discussing with you this process because I, I think it's amazing that we're at this place in little tiny Winter Park, Florida, where we're attached to globally leading thinking about how we should be perceiving the role of a library. So this is a wonderful opportunity for this intersection of technology and architecture to activate civic spaces. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, process there and what that looks like? And then we're gonna do a deeper dive into just some libraries and, and look at what you've got planned for Winter Park. Yes, so I have to say that um, Winter Park is, is really punching so high up because really what is happening with the project that I think is so powerful is that another prototype, another version of what the library has evolved already in the last 20 years is being tested right in Winter Park. And what I mean by that is that the library as a campus of knowledge. So we're moving from the object uh, building or the kind of what I call the kind of infrastructure of knowledge to the space of knowledge. And that is really what we're trying to prototype in Winter Park because of the opportunity of the scenario. We're making a space where knowledge is uh, knowledge and community facilities are being brought together in a cluster to make a sort of little village, a hamlet of knowledge. This is so unique. I don't know anywhere, short of a library on a, a short of a campus on a university, where that kind of clustering of knowledge in the public realm has happened. And that's why I'm so excited about what's happening in Winter Park. This idea of this space of knowledge where a public citizen can come, have events, learn, 
be educated, edified in some form, be a business person, or just find out about what's going on in their community or what's going on in the world is going to become a model that's going to become more and more ubiquitous. And I think that what's happening in Winter Park cannot be underestimated. It's really, for me, what's powerful about what we are all doing there as as, as architects and as client, as as community. Um, it's, a, it's a very beautiful triangle of, of, of makers, supporters, community to create this project. And David, I'm curious, have you worked in Florida before? Because I think this is a quite unforgiving habitat. And so I wonder if this was part of the challenge for you to, to work in a hurricane zone, to work with some of these unforgiving, you know, pest management issues, all the things that are going to threaten the integrity of the structure. Was that appealing to you? Had that been something that you worked with before? That's, you know me, yes. You know that that is, <laughs> that is something that I'm always keen to test our ability to make architecture in different environments and in different contexts. And Florida is a very important state in America, uh, growing. It's, it's really one of the kind of states that's also growing rapidly. So to be able to work there for me is an incredible honor. And to be able to use and test our architecture within those challenging conditions is very important. There's, an, there's a fantastic pedigree of building architecture in that environment and you know with our partners we are learning a lot about how to build the right building um, and we now feel very confident about what we're proposing um, and so it's it's been a wonderful challenge but also a big learning curve for for us too to learn how to make buildings in the tropical environment that uh, Florida really predominantly is yeah and all that fun hurricane code you get to it here <laughs> right yeah. Yeah, so I really love, so I'm going to share with you, when I showed my 20-year-old son, who is a bit of an architecture buff, uh, I showed him the design for the library, and he, he really exclaimed words that I can't repeat in polite company or on this, this oh, presentation, awesome. <laughs> and he was so engaged with what you designed, he really felt that it, it really it spoke to him as both a global citizen and a native of Florida. And it became that kind of realization point of what I've heard you talk about, where you want young people to come to these libraries more than they go to Starbucks, right? So, so to look at this and to have a 20-year-old man say something I can't repeat here, <laughs> um, maybe later I'll tell you what he said, but he was really just, he couldn't believe, and he had a sense of that immediate civic pride. And I've heard people talk about going in, certainly to the National um, Museum of African American History and Culture, and, and that reaction, that moment where people stand up a little taller. They, they behave in a little more sublime way because of the way the building is now informing their experience and calling them to maybe a different mode of being. And, and I really love the way you've reflected that kind of unique Florida experience in this design. Can you talk a little bit about some of the details that made this a Florida contextualized building? Well, um, thank you. I mean, I'm, I would like actually love to hear what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, We're too we, corporate uh, for that, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, we'll do it uh, at, at, a, at another time. But uh, no, I mean, what we've learned very much is about obviously mitigating, you know, in terms of the structure, being able to deal with hurricane proofing, etc. Dealing with, you know, things very simple like just termite proofing and worrying about the ground condition, learning to really create shade, using the building to design an, inert, uh, an in innate shade, learning from the history of sort of um, the architecture of the region, but creating a new form that really parametrically kind of creates a singular system that is both shade and form at the same time, um, and also learning about durability of materials, certain materials that will perform a certain way and others that just won't be able to cut it, and we went through a trial of things and and you know, we are just sort of glad to have had really good partners to help us kind of make sure we made the right decisions. <laughs> you probably had to answer the question, where does the water go more than one or two times, right? Because um, we just have so much rain. Absolutely, with the rainfall and also keeping rain off people as they enter the building and creating shade, exactly. Yeah. And so I'm really curious about some of the vaults that you've designed. And if you could speak yeah. to some of that, that would be really helpful. You know, it's sort of interesting. Um, I became very fascinated by this idea of uh, vaulting spaces as a way to differentiate it from sort of flat commercial spaces, which are very functional and very much about, you know, utility and just kind of doing the best efficient things, which you see typically in office buildings. We wanted these buildings to have a certain 
kind of um, distinction in their profile that would really signify to anybody entering that this was a special room for the community. I also was very much inspired by the mission styles that I was seeing also in the history of, of Florida, the kind of, you know, the sort of, um, uh, sort of, uh, sort of arch architecture, arcade architecture, porch architecture in some of the civic buildings that I saw. And so this idea of creating um, a series of rooms, what I'm calling public rooms, that really will make people feel that they are in something that's for them, that something that's different to going to a shop or to a commercial office space, but something that's about their civic role and their public role. Um, just the signature of just doing that, I think, will actually shift the way in which people see the spaces and use the spaces in a very dramatic way. I think that if you talk to people now, when you talk about a vaulted space or an art space, they think of ruins only. Maybe it's a trip to Italy or somewhere like that, or an old cathedral or something like that. And we wanted to bring back that incredible sort of audacity of those buildings and their beautiful sections to create these beautiful shapes into something as everyday as we believe a library should be. It should be as everyday as just going down to use the park. It should be that infrastructure that really supports the way in which you grow in your community or you mature in your community or you contribute to your community. And it becomes an infrastructure that really is there to help that public life. So let's talk a little bit about the siting of this library in MLK Park. At a Harvard panel discussion, it was brought up that a lot of streets were named MLK, Way, Avenue, whatever, throughout the United States, and that naming process lacked vision. And so the, the way we really wanted to honor that man who transformed culture in the United States wasn't fully realized because there wasn't a contextual vision for that street. And one of the things that I think is, is impressive about the opportunity that we have here is the libraries being built in the west side of Winter Park, which was unfortunately designed as, quote, the black side of Winter Park when it was built. And we have a chance to rewrite our narrative in Winter Park um, as this democratic space that might activate MLK Park with a full contextual vision. Can you talk a little bit about that and the opportunities there? No, I, 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 I must say I was very excited when we were told that this was the site that we could have because of the history that you just mentioned. And this idea of being able to place, you know, MLK, um, Martin Luther King, um, I love the way we just um, abbreviated his name and it's so ubiquitous and everybody knows who MLK is. Martin Luther King really, um, you know, was very much about the empowerment of communities through knowledge, through, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of emancipation of your condition, through the, uh, the access to knowledge and the connection to, to knowledge. Um, as a way to kind of empower yourself. So in a way, we're sort of building a monument to his ideals of being able to democratically give all citizens very good infrastructure, very good knowledge access, very good community support, great spaces to listen, to discuss, to debate. Um, if you, as you can see, the, the building not only just sits on the corner, but it also sort of cascades to the water's edge. We want to bring people right to this beautiful asset of this park, um, and to be able to bring people right to the water's edge and to be able to have amazing performances. So you can imagine on this platform that we put on the water an amazing concert um, or amazing poetry reading or an event or a wedding or beautiful, um, you know, baptism, bar mitzvah, whatever it might be that really allows you to be in the public space and to enjoy this asset which is created for the public. So, you know, this, this, the, the space is really for me, you know, uh, you know, and that's when we were kind of making it, I really resisted this idea of making a singular building, but it was just under this inspiration of being able to create much more than a single sort of large building, but a broken campus, a village, a little hamlet of knowledge, seemed to me like such a beautiful way to kind of celebrate what this transformation is going to be uh, on this very important corner of the, of the park and of the site. I think libraries and community facilities are probably one of the few things, you know, museums, libraries, um, sort of public communities, are the, one of the few things that are allowed to be in public spaces like parks and because they enhance and complement the park. You know, you have an interiority which is very much about a relationship to public life and you have an exteriority which is about the bucolic and the beautiful part of public life. So for me, they, they are perfect bedfellows in how we make cities. 
And I love some of the playful features that you've designed into little nooks you put in children's library areas and things like that. I want to hear from you about your vision of what might go on inside these buildings. We heard about the outdoor spaces, which really are not spaces that are used to their full potential right now in Winter Park. So we're going to get a, a, an almost algorithmic uptick in relatability to this space that we've never seen before. And so it's so exciting to think about the compounding nature of all this activity really focused on this one corner in Winter Park. But I've heard you speak about libraries as a place where people can be doing yoga and meditation, aromatherapy classes. What's your vision for what might go on in these places? Give us some ideas if you will. So, I, so some of the things that have been discussed with the library team and with the, with the city is really the, that not only is it um, library stacks, but it's digital services. It'll have maker spaces. You know, those, those technology is already exists in the existing library and it's going to be upgraded. So you can come and sort of do uh, uh, things here. You can have incredible events where robotics are being shown. And this image, we talked about a kind of ro robotics kind of uh, events happening here. So you could have mini technology conferences or product launches, et cetera, that could happen here. You also have one-to-one -one teaching spaces. You have a public forum um, that can allow for debates and, 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 um, and lectures. Um, I, would, I can't wait to come and give a lecture when we finish this building uh, to the community so that we can actually, you know, the community can engage with people in a very direct way. There are spaces that will allow more focused learning to happen or engagement and interview. So we move from everything from two to four person spaces right through to 50 person spaces that can combine, 25 and 50 person spaces that combine. But we also have traditional books because we realize the importance of reading. And the book is, you know, people thought that the internet was gonna destroy the book and we were not gonna all read, but actually we know that books are very important physical act of spending time consuming knowledge. So books are also very important there on display, but also all these other services that support, you know, for me, more than just a library, a kind of community infrastructure are here. So this is maybe one of the teaching labs, which look at different kind of computing lessons that can happen, teaching older and younger generations. This is not about just young people, but allowing older generations to be able to learn skills if they feel left out, that the library is a very easy place to go and learn without going into some kind of formal school structure. Um, or that they could be very advanced technology being learned by sort of cutting edge uh, kids who are also sort of, as it were, kindergartening and training other kids um, uh, and students who might be wanting to learn about those things in this environment. So it really is, for me, these kind of overlapping infrastructures that we now need in our communities. It's, it's teaching spaces, it's intimate spaces, it's learning spaces, it's community spaces, it's event spaces, it's spaces to gather, it's spaces in between nature and, and the urban, it's edges to feel protected but to be able to see the world and to look at your city in a different way. For instance, you're able to go up to the top of the building and really see for the first time as a public that park in a new vantage point. I'm, I'm sure most people don't have this view except for the offices that are close by, and this will soon be a public view that you can go up to. Um, and having these viewpoints and these vantage points is, well, just embolden people and elevate people about their community and their space and wanting to be part of it and contribute. And David, I don't think you get a reputation like yours without being a bit of a provocateur. So you're probably used to some critics. And well, one of the criticisms of this project uh, is that we don't have as much shelf space as some people might have imagined that we have. And my familiarity with the project really has guided me to an understanding that we don't want as much shelf space as we had before because we really want these flexible rooms that can accommodate. I saw you built in, you know, wheelchair access to the raked auditorium, you know, that, that we've got the ability to really flex and use the spaces in a way. I know college kids like to sit on those sort of graduated steps and study and maybe those are some of the visions there. Can you speak to this notion of shelf space which seems a little bit outdated and why these spaces are more programmatically flexible? So I've been working with libraries for 20 years now and um, the evolution, I mean the internet has been a huge impact on the way in which we do see libraries. Libraries post-war were, were about getting the Encyclopedia Britannica and as many books as you could into every community to empower and edify it. And academic libraries, which are universities, et cetera, are all about having the back catalogs. But a community library is very different. It's about having the essential things that support those communities 
in, in, in the right concentrations, but it's also about offering all the opportunities that the sort of ritual of going to a library has now afforded communities. It's where you go find out about all the other things. It's where you do lifelong learning. It's where you have flexible spaces for teaching programs, you know, and also just spaces that are differentiated to just being hushed at a desk you know, with shelves all around you, that traditional image of a library. You want kids to be able to sit on the floor, sit on steps, be outside on the Wi-Fi, working and thinking about ideas. That's how we are now working in our world. So we want the, the, the library to reflect that. So there's no agenda to in any way reduce the volumes. Uh, there, the agenda is to be efficient and to be compact and to, to display where we need to display and to have spaces for all the other things that enrich the library experience. And the books are there, so you can have the books. It's not about, you know, people always mix the idea of an academic library or university library with a community library. They're very different things. <laughs> well, and I'd love to talk about the role of some of these iconoclastic features you put into library design, like the curved shelving. Um, and if there's a possibility to put a, an example of that up on the slides right now, it'd be great to see how transformative that curved shelving is. It makes, talk about what happens when you put some curved shelving into a library space and how that activates the space in a different way than maybe it had been before. Yeah, I think you're talking about um, the idea store, which is in our sort of libraries uh, file. Um, but the curved, the idea of making curved shelving was really, when I was developing the idea stores, it really came to me that, you know, that there was a stigma. If you were not very well educated or hadn't, you know, felt intimidated by education environments, the sort of marching of rows and rows of academic books was, was actually probably daunting to somebody who wasn't used to using libraries. Um, communities that just feel disempowered um, from certain spaces that, uh, that do that. So in the idea store, which you're looking at now, we made a building which was open, had cafes and spaces, racks. The books were displayed almost like bookshops. They were front on so you could see them. And then the shelves were made into these spaces that were like gardens. I call them garden spaces rather than book stacks. And the idea is that you could have a little sofa or a seat, you can see somebody's head on the other side, where you could have a little moment and just kind of read a book or sit down and look at stuff or go to the next set of shelves. And to really de De sort of destructure, like to stop the sort of over formality of the library becoming a kind of burden, but allowing it to become much more playful and much more generous to browsers. The sophisticated browser still has the indexing system that is actually still working, but the answer, the, 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 the user that is not used to the library is able to playfully also kind of discover things. And also by curving books, what we realize is that you actually can see books in different ways. You see front end sometimes, you see spines. You're not just looking at spines, but you're seeing little glimpses into the way in which the, the sort of books can tease you and force you to, not force you, but encourage you to look at different kind of uh, uh, period, you know, books and periodicals around you. So not just looking for a number index, but being seduced in the way I think bookshops do so well by allowing the sort of covers to also attract you to different subject matters and to different topics. We want people to come to the library and to stay there and to see it as a kind of public living room. Um, so, you know, it, we make soaring spaces. And in the idea store, we develop, you know, this has, this has a, a sprung dance space in it where, you know, yoga, ballet, jazz, tap, um, African dance, um, Irish jigs, everything's being taught in this space with different teachers and classes. And that was incredible when we were working on the idea of creating a dance space in a library. People were like, what the hell? Why do you need that? You know, and actually it became one of the most used spaces being rented out by sort of small um, creative institutions that were what needed rehearsal space that couldn't find it, that had proper sprung floors, etc. So it actually we realized that there was a way in which you could cross pollinate a lot of sort of important programs that, you know, didn't need to be in buildings that were specifically made, but that those sort of specific programs could be brought into community facilities which would expand the usability and the, and the duration of the library. So for instance, the libraries here open till 10 or 11 at night, depending on whether it's at the weekend or not. I love this slide that you... <laughs> So I want to go into the idea store a little bit. I lived in London myself up until 2014. And can we agree that that neighborhood was not what we would describe as a destination neighborhood within London when the idea store was built? It's very deprived, very underfunded. And in a way, that first image we showed of that building was to make a sort of building that people saw in the distance, 
you know, when you look, what's kind of amazing about the East End is that when you look down the avenue, you see the skyline of the center of London with these glistening glass and steel buildings. And in this community, it was very under, under uh, invested. So we said we wanted to build the building that the community sees in the skyline that felt that they were not part of. You know, it's a city where the bankers were, et cetera. We wanted to build a building that was just as beautiful, just as good, just for the community. So we made this sort of very sort of large, environmentally friendly um, uh, glass building that had these fantastic views that could look at the city skyline, allow people to have what we call sort of boardroom views across their community, but also across to the city skyline and to really allow them to aspire to dream more. So yeah, very important project for me, really learned so many lessons on this. You know, so, uh, it's a kind of gold leads building, it uses sustainable timber, it uses, you know, a lot of things that were really become normal discussions now in, in the way in which we build. And David, let's talk about a little bit about this process. This was a global competition with submissions yeah. from people all over the world, and you were selected for this, and I believe you got Reba Silver Award. That's the Royal Institute of British Architecture, the Silver Prize the year this came out. So this is a pretty important piece of work that sort of draws a line in the sand and says, this is, I'd like us to think about libraries differently from here on out. So for Winter Park to attach to this kind of thinking is so important. And I love how you really contextualized here the neighborhood with the green market stalls really appearing on the glass. And I know that you were discouraged from using glass. I would describe some gloomy days in London as non-translucent experiences. And so glass may have been something that really took a lot of courage to use. Tell us about that process a little bit here and how that informed your work. No, absolutely. Um, you know, at, at the immediate reaction was that glass would break and it would be vandalized extreme, you know, that, uh, you know, hordes of kids would break the glass, et cetera. And we really said that we dared, you know, we wanted to say that we dared the community to really feel that this was theirs and that we believed that the success of this building was that if the community loved it, then it would be exempt from that sense of exclusion. The buildings that feel like they don't belong to the community are usually the buildings or the, or the places that are attacked during de demonstrations and, and things like that. And so it's ironic, um, you know, they were prepared to put cages around the entire building. When we opened it, we had wall to wall, you know, queues of people wanting to get in. It's still one of the most popular buildings, community buildings in the entire borough. It's caused um, a huge outpour of librarians from all over Europe and also the world to start coming to this idea store to learn from it, to study it, and has been credited with really uh, sort of revolutionizing the small library, the community library facility, which I'm incredibly proud of. I mean, there was a team of us that worked on it. It wasn't just architecture, but incredible uh, sort of forward-thinking radical uh, library services community and the city hall um, that kind of came together to say, we've got to do better for our citizens and we've got to make something that's really going to make us proud. And 20 years on, it's, it's full. And it's really, you know, our biggest problem with this building, it's being, it's, a, it's too full. <laughs> there are too many people at it. So we're having to kind of, you know, so, you know, we made it out of robust materials, but where we actually value engineered down, we now regret that to the very day <laughs> because those are the materials that are having to be changed all the time and all the robust materials have really lasted as we hoped it, it would do. And that little picture that just came through is humble in nature because I shot it on my phone when I was visiting the idea store uh, in a trip to London several years ago. One of the things I loved about this experience, and it's a really bad picture, I apologize, David, but it was it no, was this it, moment. It, just, it shows the city skyline, so I love it. That's correct. I mean, it, shows, <laughs> it shows this moment of, and the experience of being in London is very much a cooped up experience because the weather is quite bad. And I know someone's going to be mad at me for saying that, but that's, that's the fact. Sure. And so it's to have these kind of moments of wonder where you can look off into a vista and be inspired by what's out there. And the idea that you might be gaining knowledge within that space to occupy an office off in the distance one day is a pretty exciting, and that's that democratization piece at work that's so impressive. So I just love this sense of wonder that you built into that space and uh, I think that's definitely something we can look forward to in Winter Park. I just love this little image and, and how that was just off in a corner. I literally took this picture on the top floor while I was looking for the bathroom and I just stopped dead in my tracks 
didn't say what my son said when he saw your design, but it was really an arresting moment of, wow, that truly is a treasure right there. That little special place, being able to see that flanked by those green panels and, and experience it that way is really a moment of wonder. Um, and so I want to speak to your pedigree with respect to library design. So we've established this process and landscape and the whole piece around democratization, but let's really go to this portfolio. What makes you the guy to design a library? And I want to talk about some of what you did in Washington, D.C. If you could take us through some of those projects and why those were transformational for those neighborhoods as well. I'd love for you to talk about why you chose to build some of the buildings up on stilts because it was contextual for the neighborhood. Share with us a little bit about that Washington DC library experience. Okay, well, this is the Smithsonian, which is sort of, of course, um, the, 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 the building on the mall that has been the backdrop. This is a recent photo of that backdrop. Uh, it's amazing, this idea of buildings that can create empowerment. We were so blown away. This was sent to us by somebody in that crowd um, and, and that the building became the, the backdrop that they wanted to use to, to, to create uh, a sort of frame for you know, uh, the protest and the kind of opportunity to talk about the, 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 that Black Lives Matter. And we're so proud of this image. Um, for me, it's become the sort of the emblem of the building now. But this idea, you know, we were working on this project, which is this very important building um, uh, dedicated to making visible the history of African Americans in America. At the same time, I wanted to work in the community. So we worked, we, we, we won two competitions to build two libraries in Southeast and Southwest uh, DC. Um, if you kind of go forward, um, you'll see them. Um, and, um, you know, for me, it really came off the back of the lessons learned in the idea stores. And, you know, in these communities, which, you know, which were not that sort of, you know, sort of well invested in, should I say, you know, we wanted to create gems that were community infrastructure. These two buildings have won AIA awards and, and now sort of celebrated in the community. But the idea was next to this sort of uh, forest park that's uh, here next to the school that's in this uh, on the street we wanted to create this is called Francis Gregory Library we created um, um, a, a, a new sort of library building which is this sort of jewel almost looking like a sort of diamond faceted cut that interior was almost uh, played a different game it was a, it became a tree house when you're inside and it was this idea of an architectural tree house that was next to the forest that was full of knowledge and full of light so it, it's sort of brisming with, sort of brimming with light, um, and you are able to then go to the different parts of the program. You're able to have learning facilities in a, in a beautiful room that frames the forest views in the city. You're able to have teaching spaces that are intimate. Um, you're able to have soaring double height spaces that have kind of places for teenagers who want to have their own space. Mothers and children are able to kind of have the smaller spaces to learn knitting or weaving or coloring uh, sort of workshops for their children. And these are sort of seen as jewels. And the building itself is designed to be robust so that you can just rest inside the facades of the buildings even. And we love it when kids send us and teenagers send us these images of like, I was lying in that corner reading a book for hours. You know, that for us is a huge success of the project feeling like people want to be part of its environment. And you can see the layering. There are community rooms, there are different spaces for digital, traditional books, sort of uh, rooms for teaching, children's library spaces, et cetera, that are all under this gap of light. And so the building has these sort of dualities. It can look very much sort of reflect the environment around it, or in the evening when the lights go on, it really becomes this beacon and lantern that speaks to the library uh, services that are also going on late in the evening. These also open late in the evening and we love that this has become a very important thing. This is Bellevue, another neighborhood, much more residential. You can see the housing just behind. And I became really inspired by the backs of these houses, which really were not supposed to be seen, where the sort of extensions to these sort of semi-detached houses, row houses, were basically on stilts. And you know, people thought, oh, you know, we don't talk about that. But actually the entire community had this collective knowledge of houses on stilts. And I felt that there was something very beautiful about that and when we were doing the public sort of outreach to elevate that. I'm always looking for something that seems common and, and powerful in a community that doesn't seem obvious, that doesn't come from the grand narrative of architecture as in 
Greek temples or porticos, but really comes from the community, which can be elevated. So in the idea store, it was the markets, the market stands. Here it was this idea of sort of lifted, stilted buildings that create these beautiful uh, environments. And I wanted to make them vibrant with color and to use color as a way to really uplift the mood of the, the light. You can see that I love color. Um, I'm not frightened to use color in public spaces. I think it's a very, we know that color frequencies really affect the psychology of people and elevates and animates uh, young and old people in very profound ways. So using color in very targeted ways to really uplift the environment and to reflect spaces so that this sense of polyphony or sense of more than what you can see is always something that I'm always trying to do in the work because I think it gives generosity to, to the user, to somebody spending the whole day there or, or just spending an hour and it gives them something to want to come back and explore some more. Even something like a very simple staircase up to an upper teaching level, you know, being able to see out across the community and, and enter different spaces uh, for teaching and working is, is very much a part of the way in which I think. And it's not about expensive materials, it's just really about thinking through what you can do with what you have and really being able to shift past your perception of what you think things could look like. Um, so this green sort of vitrine that we created in this sort of as a division between the book areas and the teaching areas could have just been a balustrade area, but we wanted to create something that would create this wonderful sort of luminous lantern in the center of, this, of the building. And it becomes a way of, for people to understand the heart of the project which then allows you to look across to the book stats and elsewhere. And this is just looking on the street. And what's really wonderful is when we made this building and we sort of elevated it, it's south facing. So I had an environmental reason also for making it south facing and lifting it because it deals with solar gain and allows us to make a much more energy efficient building. But also by lifting it, I was sort of also speaking to this idea of the portico of the, of the, of the, uh, of the everyday. So these, this is my portico of the everyday. But what's great is that the community would have um, boot, car boot sales, et cetera, and they had nowhere to do it. They would do it in car parks, in, in schools, et cetera. And the library suddenly became the car boot sale and sort of uh, space for the community now. So it's, it's publicness was no longer shoved to the side, but this idea that happened spontaneously with the community now assembles under this building because it was a shaded space that allowed people to be able to gather from the hot sun, the hot DC sun, especially in the summer months. So it also evolved with the, with the community kind of even making more use of what you could do with this. And, and that was really powerful. And David, I just love that, that you use these types of contextual cues to inform your, your design here. And I'm thinking about the first time I heard you speak about inspiration for the public library in Winter Park. It was really about a palmetto leaf that kind of helped you think through some of those faults or the scalloping of a seashell. And so those really contextual inspiration points have an authenticity to them that are going to inform each of these spaces and make them really more relevant to that hyper local experience and so that's a, a really interesting part of your process i think that even though you're swooping in from ghana or london you're really honoring the context of where that space comes from can you talk a little bit about that for us yes for me the, uh, especially within architecture that's for, for communities for the public i think that um it's it's important to have you know the history of architecture and all that sort of professionalism but the humility to be able to make something that comes from the place i think it's very important that architects have humility when dealing with public projects to be able to listen to the discourse to be able to listen to different views and you know it's it's hard i'm not saying it's easy it's very tough and sometimes it sort of implodes, you know, and it kind of reforms again. And uh, we're able to then find consensus and to find where we agree and how we can grow things. These are very important things at the formal, at the formal edge as well as the community uh, edge. And for me, that, 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 there's, there's, that there's engagement with things that emanate from a place is very, very foundational to the way I make all my work. It's not just even community or public work. It's really for me that there's a kind of humility that has to be had in the, in the honor of being given uh, a public commission, um, which will help define a community and define the communities that succumb. And, and for me, that's the very minimum one can do in order to kind of make a, a work. Um, you know, our job is always to try and listen before we react and then react and then keep reacting and, and refining until we get to a place we have consensus. 
Well, I love this stage of where we are right now, which is we, as you know, we had a referendum in Winter yes. Park. We literally asked the public, do you want this new library? And a majority of the public said yes. And then we've gone through this very public process where we're all, you know, paying a small incremental fee on our tax bill to see this vision realized. And I, for one, think it's totally worth it. And I'm thrilled that we're having the opportunity to work with you. But you talked about this process about the public realm and about, you know, it's interesting because this project really began in the public realm through the democratic process of the referendum. And there is public ownership of this building from the beginning. Right now, of course, you're dealing with stakeholders that are custodians, as you, if, if you will, uh, city commissioners and project managers, piece like that. But I really feel that we're almost pregnant with this public baby that's going to be returned to us. And that's such an exciting process. We're, we're in that process. It's fun to see Earth moving on the site. And we are excited to speak more about this idea. You know, somebody said to me, why are you all building a library? Are people using, are people using libraries anymore? And I said, well, we're not really building a library. We're building a 21st century iconoclast where we just totally destroy the idea of what that knowledge box or set of shelves could be. And we're reimagining how Winter Park can create a space where all generations, all walks of life, all people can come together and be inspired by the Winter Park experience, which we all know is so special. And for us to be able to share that and transmit it to other people is even more exciting. So as we think through final thoughts about the Winter Park project, what would you like to share with us as we think about uh, the earth being moved over there, the demucking, all the unglamorous aspects of this project that we are going to chronicle moving forward? What would you like us to know about that? I just, you know, as I said in the beginning, I, I think that um, whilst we're deep in the sort of details of the city, et cetera, uh, on this, well, as you said, I love what you said, this idea of being pregnant with a project for the public is exactly what this is about. But as I said right at the beginning of my talk, um, this is a prototype of a knowledge campus in the public realm. It is something completely unique. This has not happened anywhere. It hasn't happened on any library projects that I've done, um, that, that there is an investment in a public infrastructure as a campus of knowledge, a space of knowledge, beyond a single object building. This is a clustering of a place to be edified in a beautiful bucolic park which is about edification and sustenance. So they're both resuscitative. One is mental resuscitation, the other one's a physical resuscitation, and they work as a kind of dialectic, a double, that really replenish the public life of the citizen. And I think that the idea that this will be really watched by other communities uh, as they understand what the library is. The library is no longer just a space for books. It is a place of the community, and it's a place of empowerment and edification. That is what the library has transformed into. And so the things that now support that are now what we're now evolving the library in the public realm to be. And this project, I think, I'm not trying to in any way say it because we're doing it, but it is because of the effort of the entire sort of custodians of the city and the community and the library services to come together to really think out of the box and to think of a new process has allowed us to birth together this incredible prototype, which I think is going to be looked at by other, other communities. It really, this simple idea of making three structures, two inhabited, uh, you know, four used, you know, the, the podium, the library, the event uh, sort of halls, the sort of post cochere sort of uh, arrivals project and the spaces in between, all as inside outside spaces that are dedicated to knowledge and knowledge giving and community edification is something radical in you. And I just think that it's something for Winter Park to be very proud of. It's gonna be something that you're going to celebrate and it's gonna be something that's gonna be the envy of other communities <laughs> because you're gonna really have something that is really of the 21st century, birthed from the 21st century and will last and be a model um, for communities as they look at how they should evolve their, their, their ways of serving their communities um, uh, as we move deep into the 20th, 21st century. It's really powerful and I'm honored to be really working on this project with you. So I always say, please, with this project, don't see it as a, as a single box. It's not remaking a box. We're making a campus. We're making a, a village of knowledge. And it's in this beautiful space and it's powerful. 
Well, you heard it here first today that Winter Park is engaging in a public prototyping process. And what a privilege to be on the bleeding edge of how people think about architecture, design, public spaces, landscapes, all the things we've talked about today. David, thank you so much for your time and engagement, for your genius in this process unfolding, for the faith that you've placed in Winter Park to be a partner in the realization of your design. Um, thank you on behalf of so many, so many citizens who truly appreciate what's happening here. We are deeply grateful. So thank you for spending time with us today. And I wanna thank our visionary uh, mayor and city commissioners and our visionary library board, all the partners and funders who've made this possible for us. Uh, we want you to follow the chamber for more information about libraries, about library design, about what's going on in this process. We're going to be helping storytell about our little pregnancy here. So we're very excited about that. And, and look to the chamber on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and LinkedIn for more information about what's happening with this. We'll be hosting webinars where we talk about the importance of the 21st century library. So look to us to to help complete your understanding of this project. And on behalf of all of us in Winter Park, thank you so much, Sir David Ajay, for spending time with us today. Thank you so much. I want to thank our partners, Hunt and Brady Architects, who really have been invaluable partners for us, learning how to build in your community. So I just wanted to make sure that I sort of call them out. We could not be doing this without their, their guidance and their help. And thank you all for allowing us to um, serve you this way. Till soon. Till more Take soon. Care. Thank you, David. Bye-bye.